Hi, I'm author Amy Shannon, and today, May 8th, 2020, my book, Passionate Retribution 4, was released on Amazon. It's available in both Kindle and paperback. It's the final book in the Passionate Retribution series. Each book um, is named Passionate Retribution, so there's Passionate Retribution, Passionate Retribution 2, 3, and now 4. And 4, as I said, is the final book. But I thought to kind of entice more readers, even if you've, if you've read the other books, this should entice you to read the next one. I um, must say that if you haven't read anything um, and you're interested in reading the Passionate Retribution series, each book is a standalone, tells its own story, but the characters are overlap into the other books. Um, the main character is Carly Edwards, and she um, she used to be an NYPD detective, and now she is a private investigator who has high security clearance so she can consult with um, agencies like the FBI, the CIA, Homeland Security, um, things like that. Um, so if you haven't read the first three books, you might want to do that before reading number four. Um, I'm going to read chapter one of Passionate Retribution 4, and I must say that it may contain spoilers for things that have happened in the previous books. So, if you haven't read the other ones yet, you might want to just pause this video until you read the other ones and then come back and, and listen, or just pick up a copy of Passionate Retribution 4. So, without further ado, chapter 1. The rain poured down, splashing loudly against the marble. Carly's wet hair dripped against her face, but her eyes focused on the words engraved in the headstone in front of her. Elliot Marshall, de decorated detective, loving husband and son. In the center of the stone at the top, the embossed NYPD detective badge. Elliot was a former NYPD detective. He retired and joined Carly in partnership with Leo Travers, the couple's best friend, in Marshall and Travers' private investigation agency. The agency changed names over the years as partners seemed to die off on Carly, but the sentiment and essence of the partnership was always there, even after death. Elliot was Carly's husband. He was dead, died two years ago today. At least that's what everyone keeps telling her. Carly didn't seem to mind the rain or cold as she stood over her husband's grave. She couldn't bring her eyes to see Tyler's grave. Tyler Matheson was Carly's former partner and close friend. He was also an ex of hers, but they always ended up as friends. Very next to Tyler was his late twin brother, Kyle, as well as Carly and Tyle's, Tyler's son, infant stillborn son, Tommy. Kyle died trying to find the answers to his brother's death, and Tyler died on a case that was more complicated than it seemed at the time. Both Tyler and Kyle were special agents with the FBI. Tyler was a former agent with consulting status though, and he had the highest security clearance of the partners of the agency. Carly dropped to her knees, her jeans pressing into the muddy grass as the rain continued to splash around her. No one listens to me, no one. Where the hell are you? Why are you doing this to me? I know you're not dead, she yelled in a low whisper to the gray stone. Everything pointed to Elliot's death. He was supposedly murdered by his cousin Sean, who eventually confessed and was sent to prison. His body burned by a stalker of Carly's. That man, Jared Duffy, burned to death after kidnapping Carly. Elliot's body was identified. He was identified as Elliot twice. She believed the evidence, and there was a lot of evidence. Yes, Elliot was dead. At least she believed it for only a short time. She even started dating Jason Williams, director of the New York office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. She had feelings for Jason, but just as things started heating up with her and Jason, she stopped it. She felt it was wrong between them. She knew it was wrong. I can't see you anymore. Why, Jason asked, sitting down on the sofa in her living room. Did I do something wrong? No, she sighed, sitting next to him and taking his hand. I'm cheating on Elliot. I can't do that anymore. He just won't understand. I've done this to him before. I can't do it. He's out there somewhere. He's gone, Carly. He was identified twice, I may add. 
You saw his body. You identified him. He's out there. I know it. He sent me that letter, she said. It was a hoax. And even if it wasn't, how do you know it was from Elliot? I know it. Jason, he's out there and I will find him. Jason stood up. Carly, just let him be dead, okay? No, he's not. He's not dead. Jason shook his head. Carly, I love you, but I guess I can't compete with a ghost. Even before you got this crazy idea that he's alive, you were still being haunted by him. This is not the same thing. Carly stood up and crossed her arms. I'm sorry, Jason. Please go. Jason looked at her and sighed. If he is out there, obviously he left you. Just let it be. Let him be dead. Never, Carly snapped. He's out there and he wants me to know it. Jason was about to say something, but he shook his head and stormed out of her penthouse, slamming the door behind him. Carly stood up. I don't know where you are, but I will find you. I know you love me and miss me. I miss you too. She wiped her eyes as the rain slowed, but still dripped down her face. She gently gripped his wedding ring that hung on the same chain as her locket. In the locket, on one side was her parents and the other side her and her older brother when they were just kids. She stared at the gold band on her finger. Her engagement ring gently pressed against it, keeping it in its place. She could never bring herself to take it off, not in all the years they were married and definitely not within the last two years. She turned around, digging her hands deep into her pocket and slowly towards the, walked towards the exit of the cemetery. Carly lived several blocks from the cemetery and worked even further, but she felt herself wandering the streets of New York City, scanning every face of each passerby searching for her husband. No, he wasn't dead. He left clues. He's out there somewhere and I must find him. She wiped her eyes as the rain slowly subsided. She walked down the busy sidewalk past the Travers Marshall Art Studio to her own office, Marshall Travers Private Investigations. She unlocked the door and looked around at the empty office. She knew Jane wouldn't be in for another few hours and Leah was out of town on a case. The PI office consisted of a large reception area, a room designated as a waiting room, and a large office that housed three desks. One was hers, one was Leo, and the other, in between the two, sat empty since Elliot has been gone. In front of the desk were shelves that lined the wall, and on the upper part of the wall, memorialized photos of Tyler, his brother Kyle, and Agnes Smythe, former receptionist and assistant, who died at the age of 98. Agnes was Jane's aunt. Jane was now the investigator's office manager. Carly even had her late Aunt Abigail's photo on the wall. Carly's ex-husband, Ted, now deceased, killed her aunt in revenge against Carly. Carly inherited Agnes from her aunt, and Terry, Carly's brother, inherited the law firm. Behind the desk was a doorway that led to a smaller room which housed a lab for the investigators, who each had a Bachelor of Science in forensics. On the other side of the room was a door that exited to the alley behind the agency. Carly walked to the back cabinet and opened the bottom drawer. She pulled out a dry change of clothes. She headed to the bathroom and changed her clothes. Carly patted her wet hair dry with a towel and then hung it on the towel rack to dry. She walked out of the bathroom and scanned the room. It always felt like it was missing someone, a few someones that photos on the wall could not replace. Carly sat down behind her desk and adjusted the photo of her and her Elliot on their wedding day. She loved Elliot before they even got together. They were partners in the NYPD, both detectives, for 10 years before they could really admit their feelings. Even when they spent one romantic stakeout making love to each other, they never spoke of it or let it interfere with their relationship, their partnership. Elliot and Carly began their life as partners when Carly was promoted to NYPD detective and she was paired up with the more seasoned detective Elliot Marshall. Carly eventually married Ted Richardson, a firefighter with her father's company, while Elliot was married to Maggie. Eventually, they divorced their spouses, and with a lot of turmoil and tragedy, they finally admitted to themselves that they loved each other. The relationship had its ups and downs, and even separations. They were married, and it lasted six years. Then Elliot died. He was murdered. But was he? Sean confessed to killing him. Duffy, the deputy fire chief, admitted he doused Elliot and set him on a fiery journey to hell. Even Jack, Carly's father, who is now a retired fire chief, said he saw Elliot's body. He identified him. Could everyone be wrong? Can we not trust what's in front of our faces? But I know what's in my heart. 
Carly tried to push the thoughts away and focus, focus on understanding her feelings. She opened the top drawer of her desk and pulled out a plastic bag that held an old crumpled unraveled paper cup. The words still haunted her, job well done, love. Thanks for the solve, I'll be around, love. At first she tossed it, but then retrieved it. She couldn't let it go. She let this cup, this simple cup with his words haunt her. Elliot was the only one who called her love. She thought she had moved forward after his death, gaining feelings of love for Jason Williams, but then this cup showed up. She was used to paper cups being left near her door with little notes on the inside that gave her information. The cups were usually white with green polka dots, a telltale coffee cup from a large, uh, a local bodega, left by an undercover police officer, Zachary Durant. Durant was usually dressed as a homeless junkie so he could work the streets. This time, the cup was paper, like the other ones, but the outside was all blue. She knew it wasn't Durant who left the note. Actually, she hadn't heard word one from Durant in a long time, and no more clues from Elliot if they were indeed from him. She even tried to find where all the blue paper cups could have come from, but every place in the city that she scoured had white paper <clears throat> or styrofoam foam cups that were either plain or had a logo or design on them. Jason and Leo tried to convince her that someone was playing a practical joke or it was a hoax, but she couldn't get his words out of her mind. Even after she identified his body, his burned body with his exact tattoo of the dagger on his thigh in the morgue, something wasn't right. If he was alive, she needed to find him, and if he's truly dead, someone was trying to get her attention. So whatever the case, whatever was going on, she needed to find out. Carly pulled her long auburn hair back in a ponytail and jumped slightly when the outside doorbell chimed, indicating that someone was entering the office. Yes, she stood up quickly. Kiki, it's me, he appeared in the doorway. Oh, Peter, she hugged him tightly. When did you two get back? Peter Barker was her best friend since they were two years old, and he and his husband, Derek, always called her Kiki. About an hour ago, Derek is getting the studio aired out, and I saw your light on. Honey, it's only 5 a.m. What are you doing here so early? He eyed the plastic bag on the desk. I don't want to talk about it. I know what you're going to say, but I don't want to talk about it. I was just concerned. I just wanted to make sure you were all right. I'm fine, all right? She snapped. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. I just got here, well, a little while ago. You were walking in the rain, huh? He lightly touched her damp hair. I can't really talk about it now. You two must be exhausted driving all that way overnight. I'm sorry. How is your mother? Better, thanks, Peter said. We're a little tired, but I saw the light on here and knew you'd be here. You know me so well, she said. Peter took her hands. That's what best friends are for. Now, how long have you been doing this? Doing what? Walking to the cemetery, spending an hour at his grave, and then walking back here all before dawn? She shrugged. I don't know, and if I tell you how I feel, you'll think I'm crazy or making things up. I don't think that. You don't believe me. I always believe you. She hugged her best friend. To be honest, I don't know what the truth is. I thought my husband was dead. I identified his body. She said others identified him too. Yeah, but think about that for a moment, he said, sitting down in the chair and she sat next to him. What do you mean? Jack said it was Elliot and they originally went off his ID. You had to exhume him to confirm it through science of forensics or whatever. Right, she said, so that means I'm wrong, right? Not necessarily. Sean said he killed Elliot. Yeah, and he's in prison for 20 years, no parole. Well, he took the deal because he said he killed Elliot, and then he did kill Leland. And that Duffy freak set the apartment building on fire, starting in your apartment. His version of sending Elliot to hell. I remember him telling me, doesn't matter, this was my fault, not Elliot's. So why did Jack think that it was Elliot? I don't know. I took my dad at his word, Carly said, looking towards the door where we win the door chime. Can we talk about this later? Of course. He smiled as Derek walked into the room. I'm exhausted. Let's go home. He turned towards his husband. Kiki! Derek hugged her when she stood up. It's good to see you. How about dinner tonight? You two go home and get some sleep. I'll see you both later. I have an appointment in three hours. She looked at her watch. Then you're coming with us. Derek put his arm around her. You're going home to sleep. Can't spend your morning walking the streets of the city and not sleep. If you insist, she said. It's been a while since I've been home. I figured, Peter said. You've been sleeping here too? Oh, well, kind of, she shrugged. When I sleep. The cot in the closet isn't so bad. Yeah, right. 
Derek, grab your bag off the desk. Let's go. You're going to sleep in your own bed, and we're going to be right there in your guest room. You guys live across the hall. You don't need to babysit me. Let's go, Caroline. Peter used her given name sternly. Uh, if you insist, she walked with her friends out of the office, locking the door behind her. So that is chapter one of Passionate Retribution 4. I hope it enticed you to continue reading the Passionate Retribution series. And maybe if you haven't, um, you know, start with Passionate Retribution, the first one. It's always 99 cents on Kindle on Amazon. Um, this has been Amy Shannon, and thank you for sharing in my stories. Bye.